everyone welcome to arcane artistry i'm co-host ron ogden and i'm the other co-host jared kajak today we're gonna pull back the veil a bit on some of the creators in the ttrpg space we think there's a lot of availability for players and interview and, and get to know a player but so little about the people who actually create this game and games just like it so what better way than to bring it to you yeah, this is our passion project, and it is brought to you by our Patreon uh, and fans of our show, The Dungeon Run. Our guest today is none other than Mr. Sean Merwin. Sean is a full-time RPG writer and editor. He worked as a freelancer and contractor for Wizards of the Coast on numerous books, magazine articles, and adventures. And he has written many convention adventures for Wizards in 3rd edition, 4th edition, and 5th edition rules. Not to call you out on your age there, Sean. <laughs> I've never felt younger. <laughs> Sean uh, also regularly worked on 5e projects for Kobold Press, Alligator Alley Entertainment. And in 2021, he became the executive lead designer for Ghostfire Gamings, which is no small feat. Sean, how are you today? I am doing wonderfully. Thanks. Thank you for that great <laughs> intro. Yeah, I, I feel a, a desire to really hit the ground running, being the first uh, artist that, that yeah. you're interviewing. I'm, I, you're I don't feel any pressure at all. Yeah. yeah. The big <laughs> cheese, the head honcho. Yeah. This show is essentially something that I've been wanting to do for a long time. It's It's nerding out, but it's nerding out with all the people you don't normally get to talk to. So mm -hmm. I feel like D&D, &D, uh, especially 5th edition, we've done a, a really, we, people, the TTRPG community has done a really good job of showing, showcasing everyone's work without actually introducing the people that have done the work. Um, and I'm personally excited because as I told you uh, before this interview even started, Sean, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, so without any further ado, uh, Jared, should we get into our rapid fire questions? Yes. Sir. Yeah. All right. True or false? Fifth edition is best edition. True. Cats are far superior to dogs. True or false? So very, very, very <laughs> false as this flea bitten thing at my feet will attest to. Yes or no? Have you ever been arrested? No. AI yeah. taking over the world or solving all the world's problems? Uh, why not both? Yeah, <laughs> my man. All right, I got one. Yes or no? Do you believe that aliens exist? Yes. On a scale of one to ten, how cool are you? Uh, can I? Is there a negative use of one to ten? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, we'll go three. Okay. I was going to go 11 for that one. Okay. Go all the way up to 11. <laughs> all right. My final one for you, Mr. Merwin. Would you be on the first commercial flight to space? No. And my final question for you. Better villain, the Joker or Lex Luthor? Lex Luthor. Ooh, I like it. I like it. I like it. These are good answers. <laughs> uh, before we go on, I know we're going to get questions about it when we release this video. What's that behind you? Yeah. That is one of the vampires from the Grim Hollow setting. Oh, nice. Ooh. We're definitely going to be talking about Grim Hollow. Yes, we are. For Shizzle. And what about the rest of that stuff on your shelf back there? Oh, those magic cards? What are those? So many. There's a magic card. There's some books. There's yeah. wires from so many devices <laughs> from the from the like late 1980s. Uh, yeah. There may be children somewhere in there. Wow. I just don't know. Yeah. <laughs> your Porticopia. children or just children? <laughs> yeah, random children. Oh, okay. <laughs> hmm. Again, going with the whole Grim Hollow thing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, for for those people that are watching that don't have a clue what Ghostfire Games is or what Grim Hollow is, by the way, definitely go Google that and check it out. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you explain to us what it is that you you currently do, Sean? What is your what's your your new title? So my new gig is executive lead designer for Ghostfire Gaming. 
Uh, what that means is I take over all of the role-playing game projects that come directly through Ghostfire Gaming and make sure they're on the right track. So it's sort of half creative, half administrative. The, uh, yeah. the, the Grimoire is the most recent out of the Grim Hollow series, correct? That's the most that's, recent one that's going to be coming out soon? That, that's correct. Uh, we did a, the final book of the trilogy that we were doing, sort of the you know, DM's guide, player's guide, monster book. Yeah, uh, is the monster book we're calling it the monster grimoire the kickstarter did 1.35 million yep. and which awesome it, which is very awesome <laughs> and so you can get the you can get the campaign guide already uh the the player's guide is in final layout for the book but the pdf is ready so you can Sweet. get that and then the monster book is in final development play testing and editing stage uh so there are 410 monsters rummaging around in my head wow and you've yep. named you've named all of them different I, names yes yeah, Susie <laughs> and fred and, <laughs> Bert. yeah yeah absolutely, yeah, okay, absolutely. All, all of the above all of the above. awesome yeah we're it. actually gonna uh get i think that's a good transition and, and segue yeah. uh right into what we are uh displaying today the art that you've brought us um, so what do you, let's start with, uh, let's start with your arcane anomaly, the tallow toad. Oh, first I want to give a shout out to our art director, Susan Helmi, who ha did the art direction and is continuing to do the art direction for this project and working with just dozens and dozens of amazing artists. Uh, the art we're looking at right now, the, the tallow toad is an arcane anomaly. The arcane anomalies are bits of of components of magic of rituals of spells that the the wizards didn't clean up well uh, <laughs> one of the one of the things in grim hollow is magic is a little less uh accepted in in this grim hollow setting being a dark fantasy sort of grim dark setting there's actually an arcanist inquisition that goes around searching for magic users oh, and like and an inquisition so, almost well almost like an inquisition and nice. no one expects the arcanist inquisition <laughs> but it's there you beat me it's, to it i was gonna say it myself uh, but you beat me to it <laughs> and and so uh and so the the magic is a, a little off in in grim hollow and this is just an example of this through monsters so right. the the tallow toad is just one of many arcane anomalies and so if you're using a candle in your ritual and you don't clean it up well, yeah. it could turn into one of these tallow toads. <laughs> are they are they considered like elementals um, or are they mostly beasts or like what category would you put these? Uh, they, they're they're all constructs. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, since since they're made from uh, there's there's one that's made of the chalk that you draw ritual circles yeah. with. Yeah, uh, that's cool. The chalk chatterling. There's another that is the uh, the ink uh, that you use to yeah. write scrolls and the stuff. If you don't, yeah. if you don't take good care of your ink, that sure. could could turn into. A, so a is this going to make all of the wizards in Grim Hollow kind of uh, what's the word um, OCD about <laughs> <laughs> cleaning up all of their mess? Yeah, well, they should be. Right. Yeah. If you're if you're messing around, the precision that you would take when you were a, a, a wizard yeah. right, to make sure you enunciate all of your spells, the verbal components, you yeah. have everything right. All the magic that's coursing through all of those things. If you don't take good care of that, yeah. just a, and that's what uh, this chaos. the the writer here imagined is is uh, is all the chaos that could come from that. I and, love it. Yeah, yeah, I love that too. That's great. So yeah, who, especially if you who, think of things like circles that you can't uh, get perfectly cir circular, right? Like that mm, would and, it, and, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so who gets to choose the art for what makes it into the book? Like you said, four hundred and ten monsters, and this is obviously a great work of art. I absolutely love it. And I can see why you would choose to put it into the book, and it, it fits in well into like the D and D mechanics or mm -hmm. fifth edition mechanics. Uh, who gets to decide that? That's generally Susan's uh, okay. bailiwick. Uh, yeah. Some art or, we're using, we already had. Uh, so that then became contingent on the, the designer of the monster looking at the art and making it fit. Yeah. 
-hmm. But for most of it, the art is being done from scratch based on the monsters that we got in from the designers. Ah. So detailed because imagine if you were the artist and you got, you know, you were got a commission to to make something. Yeah. All the questions you would have about about the the monster or the NPC or even the landscape. Uh, you know, how do you want their hands to look? Sure. What, where should their eyes be looking? You know, those sorts of things. Yeah. And a lot of it, the artists will have a feel for it and be able to do on their own. But you try to answer in an art order all of those questions, uh, as well as what size art do you need? Is it going to be just a quarter page? Is it going to be a full page? Is it going to be along, uh, you know, a column along the side of the book? All yeah. of those things need to go into that creation of the art order, which makes a monster book one of the hardest books to create Yeah, because yeah. you have a lot of art going yeah. into it and it's got to be very specific. So the designer actually designs the monster first, the writer mm -hmm. or the designer designs it, and then that gets sent to, uh, I'm sorry, what was her name again? Uh, Susan Helmai. Susan Helmai. Yeah. So sounds like we need to have Susan on the show at some point as well. Oh, so yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so you hear that, Susan? We're calling you. <laughs> uh, so then it gets sent to Susan, and then Susan just has a list of artists that she has worked with before or that she knows, and then she sends out the art order to that artist, and that person responds. Correct. That's cool. That's pretty much exactly what happens. And she's worked in the industry for years uh, as well. Mm -hmm. uh, she's worked for Wizards of the Coast on projects, and and so she has a a long list of, of artists who she's yeah. connected with. Uh, and, you know, it might not be a bad idea to talk about what goes into the writing because that's a process sure. in and of itself. Um, sure. A lot of people don't, don't know that. So generally what happens is you will send out to a freelancer or to a person working with you, the, uh, an outline of what you're looking for. Uh, sometimes it can be very specific. Sometimes very general. They will send you in their work. That's the designer. It gets read over uh, usually and then sent to a developer. Hmm. What the developer does is goes, goes through it and looks at it in terms of rules, uh, making sure all the rules fit, all of those things uh, line up with the game that you're actually playing. So it's balanced. Um, yep. Yep. Got and it. the designer for this book was Chris Sims, hmm. who worked for Wizards of the Coast. Uh, he was a designer on the original 5e Monster Manual. So he doesn't he get knows, any better than that. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. <laughs> so after it comes out of design, if there's any major problems, uh, it will either be sent back to the designer mm -hmm. or the, the lead designer, which would be my job in this case, looks at it and makes whatever fixes need to be made. I know. Then it goes, uh, once it's in that shape, then it goes to uh, Suzanne who will, do the art order, make sure, and then do an initial layout. So we know what shape and size the art needs to be. Mm -hmm. Then cool. the editor will make a pass looking for the more of the misspelling, uh, obvious, yeah. obvious mistakes. Then it goes, the arts added, it goes into final layout. So you can imagine with 400 plus 400 plus monsters yeah. all going through that process. It yeah. is, it yeah. is not something for the faint of heart. Speaking of which, why don't we uh, show show the audience uh, yeah. another pick? What would you like to talk about next? Let's talk about the suture golem. Oh yeah, cool. Love this. That's no, super creepy. So cool. It's yeah. Creepy. So the suture golem came from a uh, a student that was in my writing for role playing games class at the local university, uh, and the the final projects that we worked on coincided with me doing this book. So it was sort of perfect. And then I, so I looked at the monsters that the students submitted. And if anyone obviously, you know, had a knack for this and came up with really creepy, great monsters, I was like, Hey, why don't you submit four or five monsters and we'll see if we can use them in the book. And five of the students out of 20 students um, ended up with monsters in the book. Oh, so that wow. was, that was, that was a really cool. And this is a great example. And you know, all of these students, I am, I was born in a year, uh, that is in the sixties, <laughs> the late sixties, <laughs> the late sixties, but the sixties. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, having new players, having people who are experiencing games for the first time, getting their ideas, getting their input 
is just amazing. And yeah. the ideas that these uh, that these students were coming up with, several of whom had been playing since they were, you know, very young. Yeah, uh, it was just great. And this is an example. Of, fresh meat, of, right? Yeah. Yes. Fresh meat. <laughs> and, and the suture golem. Yeah, yeah. Is is made of fresh meat. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so this is th this comes from. Uh, well, what if you have, we want to make a golem, but you don't quite have all the parts you need. Uh, why not use the actual, you know, thread <laughs> that, yeah. that it's made of and have it go out and build its own body and then oh, just okay. sew, sew it, sew it, uh, sew it, the bodies it makes up. So once it runs out of dead bodies to attach to itself, it just creates dead bodies to attach to itself. That's that's exactly <laughs> right. It's, a, it's like a clockwork golem, but not clockwork so much as dead meat. Yeah. Dead meat golem. Yep. Yeah. My but, favorite part of this art is the the hands that are coming together uh, around the skull and holding the skull. Yeah, holding place. the skull in place. Yeah. That is and, uh, terror material right there. <laughs> and that's why as a designer, it's great because you can have a vision of something and then an artist, a really talented artist gets a hold of it yeah. and it just blows your mind because, yeah. you know, they're adding their vision to it as well. And generally is, is a very uh, fulfilling process of yeah. getting all of those things. Now, are there stacked. any changes that you will do if you get back art from an artist that is particularly great that you'll, that then will inspire you to make design changes? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, sometimes it comes in. So it surprises you. It's like, oh, we didn't think about that. But you know what? Change that claw attack to a slam attack because instead of hands, it has, you know, clubs or right. you know, sure. whatever. Right. Uh, one of the neat things that we did in the book as well, and I'll use the suture golem as an example, is put in salvage rules. So oh, Grim Hollow yeah. is, is not a place where people are have the time, expertise, energy, or uh, will to go against the Arcanist Inquisition. So you really have to sort of make your own magic as you go along. So we've made new magic items and given rules for, in the case of a suture golem, if you take their, the wire, the suture wire that they're mm -hmm. made from, mm -hmm. you can make a magic item from that that acts like a net, oh. a magical net. Yeah, and then and so we've got you know several new magic items that are salvaged from the the remains of these beasts that you kill, and, and you can build as we've tried to do sort of this ecosystem then of, you know, this monster is really really hard to kill, but if you have a piece of this other monster, you can then build the sword you need to defeat yeah. this monster, yeah. and it, it becomes a, not only reward but its own story. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you yeah, got to right. kill the unicorn to get the unicorn's horn. So then you can go right. stab the demon yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. sure. Precisely. Yeah. Yep. I love it. And this next one is the, I believe you call it a, a Chiroptrian behemoth. Yep. Yep. That just basically means big bat. So this is one of the high CR monsters from, yeah. from the book. And it's kind of like a tarasque, or at least it looks yeah. the size big, of a Yeah, it seems yeah. very big. Legend, legend says that there's only one, although it's been seen or reported to have been seen in places far distant from each other. So maybe there's more than one. It's, we'll, we'll find out. Or maybe and it also travels, <laughs> travels through time and space or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yep. I like and it. another another thing we put in is a lore section for each monster. So if you don't want to be the DM that just says, okay, it, it's vulnerable to fire, but it's immune to the, the there, there are checks. There's history checks, arcana checks, survival yeah. checks, all of those things. So as the DM, you can call for the check and give a small piece of information rather than trying to give everything at once and sort of make that part of the fun reward those the person that takes, you know, high arcana skills or, sure. or yeah, those. So, uh, this behemoth serves a, a grand duke in one of the areas of Grim Hollow who happens to be a vampire. Um, it's only been verified that one is in existence. So this, the, this leader, uh, Grand Duke Koshevek, sends this behemoth out to deal with his enemies or anyone uh. who tries to usurp his power. Uh, but he's been seen in far to the north in the frozen lands of the Valken clans. He's been seen far to the south. So... Maybe he's around. 
I like uh, it. Well, and and when it's... you're that big, circumnavigating any sort of planet is probably pretty <laughs> easy, right? Like, yeah. Just a couple yeah. of wing flaps, really. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Especially if you can fly all night. Right. There yep. you go. And he, I'm not going to spoil, but but this uh, this fella happens to be one of the creatures that is practically impossible to kill unless you figure out its weakness. Mm. Like and then it. then you have to get those ingredients to right. put together the concoction. Then you're going back to your salvage rules. Yes, like you're yep. talking about. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And I love that this is tied to lore. You know, like when I when I DM, there are plenty of times where. Okay, you don't necessarily your character doesn't necessarily know about the troll, for example. Uh, roll a religion check or an arcana check, depending on what your skills are. But you're talking about beyond that. You're going even beyond where it's like, well, but there's survival checks and there's uh, other things that might give you insight into what's going on. And I think that's right. Just, that's just good. That's just good design. Yeah, and that that's what we you know wanted to do right from the start. So uh, we had the designers working on it, and they came up with some great ideas and. You know, we sprinkled in our own stuff once we got it in during development and, and it was, you know, it's worked out pretty well. That's awesome. That's great. Well, uh, Sean, I have a question that I've been dying to ask you uh, it's All a little right. bit a little, uh, away from the art specifically and more about Sean. Um, okay. But uh, so what got you into freelancing for TTRPGs? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so I, Played, I've played D&D since I was nine. And growing up, I wanted to do this, right? If you love the game, like we love the game, yeah. it's like, how, how can I do this for my living? But during first edition, second edition, there was no, there was no license. There was no open gaming license. There were probably two jobs in the industry. <laughs> and the only way to get published was like Dungeon or Dragon Magazine, which was, you know, send in your one article out of 10,000, put it a self-addressed stamped envelope. If you remember those days, uh, because internet, what's that? And, and so finally, you know, life caught up to me and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do this for my life, but I always had to write. I always wanted to write. So I was always writing something when, when third edition came out in 2000, um, my daughter was born right again almost the exact day the game dropped. Wow. And so we're, I was going to have a lot of time to be home. And, and I thought maybe we could get a game going third editions out and uh, living forgotten realms was the adventurers league of that time, or, not living forgotten realms, living Greyhawk. I'm sorry, was the adventures league of, it was the organized play of that time. And so each region of Greyhawk was coordinated to a region of the real world. And I was in New York state. So I was Keoland and there was a group of three people called a triad in charge of all the content for that region. Their volunteers didn't get paid, but that was their job. So I got the first adventure and I was going to run it for some friends I'd met online. And I read the adventure. I was like, boy, this isn't great. You know, this could be so much better misspelling, you know, all that stuff. And I had an, I had an English degree. So I'm like, Hey, so I write the, the triad and say, could I help in some way? And they're like, no. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, Dang. okay, then. So, so, you know, I ran a couple more adventures. I said, boy, you know, these, let's do this. You know, so I emailed them again. Can, is, can I help? Could I edit? Could I do anything? Yeah, sure. N no. Wow. <laughs> so after about, it's that, writer, year, it's that writer rejection, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, you couldn't even, you couldn't even volunteer your wow. time at wow. this point. Well, through, through just perseverance, I, I finally got some editing job for, for them, you know, edited this adventure, did the best job I could. They liked it. Then they said, Hey, could you write this thing? And I wrote this thing and send it in. And then they mm -hmm. said, Oh, could you? So after a year and a half or so, I became one of the triad members in charge of adventure writing. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so I did that and just then it led to wor working, volunteering directly for the head of the uh, Living Greyhawk campaign. And then it was a, you know, small thing for wizards. And then it was, oh, could you be in charge of this new campaign that we're running called Zendrick Expeditions? It's mm -hmm. organized play, but it's set in uh, Zendrick and Eberron. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of four people to be in charge of that full campaign. Wow. And, you know, and you just whenever you get an opportunity, make the best of it. Yeah, do you the best, you do your best work. Uh, you know, don't, 
ruffle as many feathers as you can yeah. uh, and just keep going and just keep going. Yeah. And that's, that's the, I could, you know, take you step by step by step, no, but that's, that's, that's yeah. 20 years of, of that basically. Yeah. Perseverance, uh, trying hard and working hard. This is what yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. It's <laughs> when I was very young, I made a list of things I wanted to do. Right. Yeah. And one of them was like, get, get published in a D and D hardcover. Sure. And so when, you know, when you do that, you're like, okay, I did that. And that would have been Dungeon Delve, uh, a book of 30 short adventures for fourth edition. And so I, I wrote like six of those or five of those uh, short adventures. And so I was like, okay, I've made it. But yeah, but but I also hadn't. Right. right. Because what's next. And then when I worked on acquisitions incorporated, now that was huge because that, that was, yeah. I, uh, I worked on it mainly with Teo Sabadia uh, mm -hmm. and I did most of the writing for it. Uh, and that was working with a hugely popular D and D show, right. Yeah. Hugely popular D and D stream. And, and, you know, it was great to work with all those, folks at at, at uh, Penny Arcade, worked with Scott Fitzgerald Gray, who's an amazing editor who works for Wizards, uh, worked with Teos, which is uh, always great. And uh, and so I was like, OK, here I am. But then it's, you know, it's like, OK, what's next? What's next? Yeah. yeah. And what's next? And, and now I'm working full time as, you know, as a person in the industry, which I never dreamed in a million years after I was 10 years old would happen. Yeah. And and it's it's a dream come true and it's also a full time job that's hard yeah right yeah, so sure. here here i am and and what's next well what's next is writing a story bible for the next project that's <laughs> yeah, coming yeah. right yeah. and then you just yeah. you just keep you keep doing it and yeah. if it's something you love to do then that's what you have to do yeah. right? right because it doesn't, if, it doesn't feel as much like work when it's something that you're yeah. you know passionate about it's true it's yeah. true and the, the, the amazing thing is, even if I could no longer do this as a job, you know, I go back and I'm a project manager for a software company at night. This is what I would be doing. For sure. I would be sitting here writing. Yeah. So it's, it's something that you just do because you sort of have to do it. Yeah. Well, that's a great uh, segue into my next question for you, which mm -hmm. is um, what has been your favorite, most fulfilling project that you've ever worked on? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> Hard questions here. Hard questions. Yeah, it, it is. It is. As we discussed, I've forgotten half the things I've worked on. <laughs> well, then I would um, say that that's probably not your favorite or most fulfilling if you've forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Well, true. yeah, except for the age creeping in. Well, uh, sure, that, sure, that's, that's true. No, it's you know, the, the acquisitions incorporated was fulfilling in the sense that I, I've always loved comedy, but comedy comedy is a huge part of gaming as you both well know. Yes. Yeah. But it's not a huge part of designing, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the humor happens after the book is published and the rules are out and the adventures out and, and that's, that's handled at the table mm -hmm. with acquisitions incorporated. It gave Teos and I the opportunity to put humor into the game. Yeah. And, and so writing that was, was, fulfilling because it's not often where you're you're writing a, a D D rule and you start laughing yeah or you know teos would send me something and i'd snicker and it's a rule right it's not an adventure it's it, it was actually a rule i'm like okay and you know we we'd go back and forth and so it was it was a much much different project than anything i'd worked on before for that reason and in that sense it was it was an itch that i badly wanted to scratch yeah uh, is there any moment that you remember in in those conventions that you went to where you were running a game or playing in a game that really sticks out in your mind as far as like the time that you you know ran the same adventure six mm -hmm. or eight times where you were like wow i would have never thought of it that way or i'm, I'm surprised the player came at it from that direction all the time yeah. Uh, yeah. I would run it eight times and it would be different eight, all eight times. Right. Sure. Sometimes wildly different. Uh, I, I still remember uh, at winter fantasy in for one year, it was at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. And that was the first time I'd really written an adventure that was a campaign wide adventure for living Greyhawk. So I'm standing at this convention center in the Meadowlands and it's the size of two, two football fields. 
and everyone is playing my adventure and I'm just standing there going, this is, this is unbelievable. Yeah. And then somebody walks by just totally bad mouthing it. Oh, no, no. <laughs> how, 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 how bad it was. Yeah. And, and so I, I engaged the person, you know, yeah. I was like, did what? you just play that adventure? And so he said, yeah. And I was like, what, what was wrong with it? And it turned out that he was mad because in those adventures, anyone could put from level two to level 16 could play it. Mm. Um, so you have to, you know, you have to put in at level two, they fight goblins at level five that, you know, fight this into, yeah. and all of the monsters did poison damage. And he was upset because at low level, poison is very deadly. Even in third edition, uh, poison is very deadly at high level. Everybody has a hero's feast. So poison is nothing. And so he was mad about that. And that that's why he hated the adventure. And so I said, well, I wrote it. And he, you know, the, immediately he's like, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah. And, and it came down to that's what he was wrong about. I'm like, yeah. you know, you're absolutely right. And next time when I do those higher level monsters, I will make it something that actually does uh, threaten high level. But, you know, <laughs> gamers are generally, at least the ones I've dealt with, very generous uh, about these things. And they, they want they want the game they want the hobby to succeed they want things to be better yeah. um, so i i love feedback even if it's negative as long as it's constructive um yes. you know you get the people out there who just tear it down because they're trying to make a name for themselves yeah, and right. you do their thing and, and you can throw all that out uh but you know there's there's lots and lots and lots of right and wrong ways to do all of this uh Based on the player type, your DM style may be completely wrong when it would be completely right for something else. Right. The yeah. rules you make could be completely wrong for a certain type of player, but completely right for another. So you're trying to hit a moving target anyway. So you may as well get all the feedback you can and yeah. and learn how to you know slow that dartboard's movement so you can hit it uh, exactly. a few more times. That's great insight. That's so great insight, especially so, about like what you write might be good for some and bad for others. For yeah, sure. So Sean, what's your jam? Like if you got to do what your dream project, let's say, or, or your, your dream home game, let's say you had all the time in the world and all the money in the world and you can get together a group of, of friends or, or, or whomever actors, whatever you want to run your own thing. What would you want to do? I, because of this being my work, I just want to laugh once per year. I go with my home game group to a convention and we just sit and play. Really? And yeah. And I'll like, I'll be pulled away for a meeting and they'll be on their own for a slot or two, but then we'll go back and, you know, at least twice a, a day, we'll sit down all together and game. And generally we have the DM crying with laughter by the time we're done. And that's how I know that, I'm, I'm having a good time because the joy is being shared. And always what happens is I'll be away from them for a slot. And after the convention day ends, we'll go to a bar or go to a coffee shop or wherever all the DMS are hanging out. And I'll always hear somebody say, yeah, there was this one table I had, there were six half work barbarian brothers and they just, they were doing all this strange stuff. They, they used each other as battering rams and they, Oh, we we're just joking about their mother. And oh, it was so I'm like, that's my home group. <laughs> like, really? I'm like, yeah, that's 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 my home group. Uh, what are some tips and tricks slash possible pitfalls that someone wanting to become a writer in the TTRGB space might benefit from knowing? Uh let's see. The the best advice I have is make sure you do your work. Um, and what is your work? Well, your work is to create and your work is to don't overlook uh, other kinds of work. So if you want to be a writer, you should be reading and you should be writing and you should be reading and writing not only game stuff, you should be reading and writing poetry. Uh, you should be reading and writing everything and you're going to fail sometimes and that's okay. Just don't give up learn from those things that don't quite work and talk to other people who, who are doing the same thing as you and share stories about what worked and what didn't. And, and it's, you know, it's as much as we love role-playing games, you know, this, this isn't like the Academy Awards. Right? We're not, we're what? not walking down the street and people. It's are, not. 
No, no. Believe it or not, take the work seriously, but not yourself seriously. Mm. Um, um, let's see. The pitfalls. Uh, the pitfalls are basically the same thing. Um, right. You know, do, do the work, do your due diligence, um, love what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, you can still do it, but you might love something else more. Uh, so, you know, so do that. Yeah. And, and Were there uh, any pitfalls or, or mistakes that you remember that you had in your career specifically that oh. you, you felt like you really learned a lot from? Oh, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm perfect. Everything I, I do is superior. Play, play testing and listening to feedback uh, is, is important. Uh, sometimes you, even I at this point get lazy about like play testing and sure. I'll be like, Oh, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to play test this. And then I'll come back to it, you know, two weeks later to, for editing or reviewing. And I'll be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, this, this should have been play tested. But when I was first writing adventures for, uh, the fifth edition adventures league, the first adventure I wrote called defiance and flan, had to be five short adventures, each playable in exactly one hour, because literally they were going to put it down at a convention and sell tickets for exactly one hour. So it couldn't go over. Wow. Uh, so I was, I was, I play tested it with four or five different groups. I had a stopwatch and I ran through each one and like, go, here we go. Blah, 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 you know, and, yeah. and you know, that's the sort of uh, precision that sometimes your work needs. Yeah. And you know, are you, going to be willing to spend those four weekends um, to, to make sure it's, it is what it needs to be. Well, I'll right. tell you right now, a one hour adventure as a DM already gives me anxiety. So, uh, <laughs> uh, wow. I can't believe you did five of them and not only ran them, you developed them. So that's, yeah. that's, that's insane. What jobs have you done outside of being a artist and designer in your life and did those help you at all uh, whatsoever in, in your art, in your, in your work? And I know you went to college for writing, right? Among, among other things, teaching and writing, yeah. 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 Do you feel like that has also helped you in your, in your career and in your, your game design? Absolutely. Uh, I think what I always compare DMing to teaching because a lot of the skills that you use in DMing are super important in teaching, right? If you're teaching a class, you want to look at every student as you, as you talk to make sure everyone's focused, everyone's nodding or looking at you. How's that different than a DM, right? You talk mm -hmm. to the players, you go around, you make sure you address everyone. Same thing, uh, articulating uh, points clearly. Uh, so, you know, DMs need to do that. Being able to do four things at once, right? Grading papers while you're... <laughs> <laughs> doing this while you're doing that, uh, keeping everything in order, all of those things. Um, and plates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, precisely. So, you know, I, I always equate DMing with teaching. And then uh, the other job I had was, well, it was a series of jobs for a software company that lasted 20 years from the ground up. First, I was a technical writer. Well, like I said before, a technical writer is basically a game designer because um, you're writing a manual that people use to follow these steps to play this game. Uh, then I, at the end, became a project manager. Well, your project manager, that's exactly what I'm doing now for Ghostfire Gaming, except mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, on the more creative side of things, uh, dealing with rules, but also dealing with freelancers and sending contracts. And, and uh, you know, we, we've had, we had probably 25 or 30 designers work on monsters. So that's a lot of paper to shuffle you know, plus coordinating internally with, with the product team and the marketing team and, and, uh, you know, sales and everything. So yeah. Uh, gaming is, is something that requires a lot of different skills and sometimes very diverse skills. Uh, my right brain is working as much as my left brain, uh, at, you know, as I, as I go through my day. And you just recently came off a very successful Kickstarter uh, with the Dungeon Dudes too, right? Through Ghostfire? Yep. It was a project that I didn't work directly on because what Ghostfire is doing, we're making our own things, but we're also partnering with people. Sure. Um, we're, we're calling the program Forged with Ghostfire. 
So if, you know, if somebody comes to us with this great project and they say, you know, here, here's the text, we've got this, but we don't know how to run a Kickstarter. We don't know how to make minis or maps or, you know, market this, then we'll pick up from there and, and go forward. We'll handle the editing. We'll handle the uh, art. We'll handle that, that sort of thing. Production. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so Grim Hollow is Ghostfire's own project. Correct. And the Drakenheim, the Dungeon Dudes, that's something that you've partnered with them to create. Correct. Awesome. Yep. yep. And so, yeah, the uh, Grim Hollow was the creation of the president uh, of, of Ghostfire Gaming and some of his players who are now uh, working with the company in various roles. So, you know, that was their home game. And one of the things that attracted me to working with them was uh, looking at that first book they did that I didn't work on the campaign guide. And I was like, mm. you know, sometimes you're skeptical about third party books and you're like, eh, I don't know. And I looked at this and I was like, wow, this is some, not only is it really imaginative stuff, but the design of it is really good to it. It's so attractive to players and DMS to have these new types of weapons, right. Down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, let's go ahead and move into our next uh, section of uh, displaying the art and show and tell here. Um, I know we've got, let's start, we'll just go in number order here. So let's do uh, the Oblivion Undead first. Okay, yep. What can you tell us a little bit about this? It's very creepy. Ooh, those are nice. Yeah. yeah. So the uh, they're, they're called Oblivion Stalkers, mm-hmm. and they are, the best way I can describe them is more corporeal forms of shadows. Mm. Uh, okay. And they tend to whistle right before they strike. So if you're walking through the dark and you hear a whistling near you, uh, watch out, duck, because it might be uh, something, an oblivion stalker behind you. And there's different forms. So it's not only um, like humanoid forms, but animals can be turned into these types of undead. Um, and they, they tend to always attack in packs. And if you whittle them down to just a single member, uh, of the of the group, they may disappear into nothingness uh, before you can kill the final one, which may may or may not be good for you. Right. <laughs> I love that description. Uh, yeah. Looking at this picture, uh, nightmare fuel. So yeah. That's yeah. Good. I mean, you're you're right oh. on there with the grim hollow stuff. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> do, do me a favor, and uh, we're gonna edit this part out so Jeff doesn't use any of these ideas <laughs> in. <laughs> our little stream i'll send him a preview copy yeah okay (laughs) great all right next on this list tell us a little bit about rhyme hunters so this art is by uh suzanne herself our our art director and they haunt the plains of the north the frozen north Uh, they kind of remind me a little bit of um uh, Game of Thrones, The Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah sort of the White Walkers. White Walkers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, White Walkers from uh, So, yeah. so they're they're uh, for for the most part zombies. They they feed off your warmth, uh, basically. So, like le- unlike zombies in regular D anD D, these will try to grab you, and when the, once they get a hold of you, it gets mighty cold. Mm. <laughs> Now, is, does it get cold because they're sucking the warmth out of your body? That's exactly what, uh, that's uh, what happens. That's yep. fun. I like that. That's yep. uh, that's also terrifying. Uh, sure. Are you allowed, Sean, to talk about how challenging these monsters are? Are you allowed to mention? Challenge rating, sure. Um, we, we and I considered uh, sort of bumping up the challenge while keeping the challenge rating lower than it should be, because it's more of an art than, than a science in terms of challenge rating. There are formulas you can use, but there's still a lot of wiggle room. Uh, these sure. are just CR1, uh, CR1 monsters. So, uh, But if there's a pack but, of them, then that's a whole nother story, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. And, but really what I ended up doing was sort of keeping it more on par uh, with, with what you'd get in a, a monster manual. Uh, because we didn't want then somebody who didn't know about Grim Hollow to buy the book and say, oh, well, I'll just use this CR2 monster and, and have it be very different than, yeah. than a CR2 monster yeah. from the monster manual. So 
What are yeah. your thoughts on we when we can go to the next picture? But what are your thoughts on uh, on the challenge rating system in D anD D? Because I I have found it to be tricky at mm -hmm. at at best. Yeah, I mean, challenge rating is like a speed limit. Um, it's good to have there. It's generally good to to go buy it, but sometimes <laughs> you just you just have to go faster, and sometimes you just have to go a heck of a lot slower. Yeah. Uh, so you know, the 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 monster manual does, and the DM guide do a pretty good job of telling you how to make monsters, and it'll put you in the right ballpark. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the big pitfalls of creating monsters is trying to do too much with it, especially with low level monsters. Sure. Um, you, you know, you want to, you want to be able to do all these cool things and suddenly it has 12 resistances and seven abilities. And the, the action economy of fifth edition is much like it was in other editions, right? You get an action, you get a, you can move and then, Hey, you get a bonus action, but that's all. And that's goes the same for monsters. So you're giving something 27 different attacks may seem cool, but the DM can still only use one at a time. Right. So, yeah. So we, yeah, we don't want to overdo. It. Yeah. All right. So now cool. we're getting into uh, this next picture. Uh, I, I'm assuming this is sort of a, a, an angel of some sort. I believe it's called a pact break. Yeah. So this is an, in fact, a, uh, an angel, but it's more of a, an angelic construct. Oh. And what they do is hunt down, uh, people that have made hunt down mortals that have made allies of uh, fiends and aberrations. Uh, so they, they can sense beings that are bound by these horrible um, packs and cut them down. Because AKA warlocks, warlock hunter, <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. Yep. Nice. And you what you, a... what you, what, what, what I should mention about Grim Hollow is there are a lot of ways to make darker characters. Uh, so you can become liches, you can become vampires, you can become, uh, fey touched like dark fey touched uh you can become all of these things and most of them involve making a pact with a darker power so if you have characters that have taken this sort of dark turn yeah the the pact breaker is there for you to give consequences for their sure. actions gotcha. yeah so and the and the the player characters that decide not to take those deals or those powers that they get rewarded in a way by not having to deal with the pact breaker. Exactly. I like that. Well, except that their friends now have to deal with it. So, right. <laughs> yeah. But well, that's, just, that's I mean, what you, you just sit let back your and friends. Life. Yeah. You just let yeah, your friends yeah, deal yeah, with yeah, it on yeah, their own. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Especially but, well, campaigns, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you'll, I mean, you'll figure it out. And one of the big conceits in Grim Hollow is this sort of, it's a very, very dark world. And, you know, do you want to give into that darkness to get that power? And you can, you can get some very powerful things uh, with the added abilities that, that the uh, player's guide and the campaign guide give you. But there's also drawbacks mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes pretty significant drawbacks if you do that, such as, you know, if you die and you've made a pact with a devil or, or a powerful undead, yeah, they they're not so big on sending your soul back if somebody casts raise that. They're yeah, more yeah. likely to to keep you. Uh, yeah. So, so you know you may get this power, but be wary yeah. of the consequences. I want to give okay. our Patreon people a chance to ask. Sure, uh, sure. There's only two. Um, okay. Spider Burn asks: When writing adventures for books, do you find it challenging to leave the GM a bit of freedom to quote unquote make it their own? You know, that, that is like the big question of adventure design is how detailed do you want it to be? And what I've found is it's better to put in the detail that DMs can leave out. DMs are creative folks. They know how to make the changes they need to make to fit their group. But a DM might have a harder time, especially a newer DM, if there are too few details trying to fill in blanks. So it's, it's better to make it more detailed with the understanding that it can be changed than 
less detailed with the understanding that maybe the DM will have a hard time filling in those blanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Uh, and Jason DeBit, speaking of artists, hey. he's the artist for a lot of the art on our show. So, uh, J- JD illustrates Jason asks, do you write descriptions of creatures and NPCs based on your own head canon, or do you use the gaming artist's rendering to mold your descriptions? I think we've kind of already answered this, but go ahead and take a shot at it. Yeah, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's both. I the first time I had to write an art order was for an adventure I wrote with Bruce Cordell uh, back in third edition, fourth edition. Uh, called Assault on Nightworm Fortress. And so he, you know, I wrote, turned in my design and said, here it is. And he said, great. Oh, could you send me art orders for this, this, and this? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about because that was really my first time I was doing it at that level. Mm -hmm. So he was very kind and he, you know, told, gave me some samples of his art orders. And so I, I wrote it up based on what's, what's in my head uh, for that. And sometimes there's something in the canon already that will shape it for you. Sure. Uh, but it's funny because I'm not a very visual person. I think in words, I don't think in pictures. I'm terrible at like spatial puzzles and, and things. Cause I'm always thinking in words. Um, but for the two, the first two times I turned in art orders for wizards products, those became the cover art. The, wow. So wow. either I did a good job of envisioning it and describing it, or the artist did a good job of picking up on my failures because the cover art for uh, that and the cover work for halls of Undermountain, um, where they're being lowered down into the, down the well into from the yawning portal tavern and they're shooting at goblins that are coming up after them uh, were orders that I wrote. So uh, that's great. Yeah. I, you must I, have done something, right? Yeah, right. I know. And I was like, <laughs> okay, a I just column a, a little column B, right? It's exactly. Good pairing, good pairing. Yeah, I just you count count on your artist to be the professional artist that they are, yeah. and uh, you know pick up anything that that you may have missed. We've experienced that with Jason specifically, mm-hmm. the person who asked this question, because uh, yeah. we got questions about that, our own characters. Like, what do you want them to look like? How do you you know what are your your feelings about what's in your head? That kind of stuff. Um, so it's uh, working with Jason like that has always been a very much like a cohesive uh, yeah. hand-in-hand kind of relationship. So it's always yeah, good. and it's great to have those sorts of relationships. I think that's sure. really how you get the best of anything that you do. That's collaborative. Um, yep. When you when you really work and and work well, uh, the art just is easier, right? The the, the stuff you create becomes better. Yeah. Just because of that. So. For sure. Well, I Sean, this it. has been absolutely amazing thank you so much for coming on the show i i cannot thank you enough i i i mean just thank you for coming on the show but also all of the the juicy tidbits it's really opened my eyes to what game design truly is and how much work goes into that is there anything that you would like to plug is there anything that you're working on is there anywhere that you want people to follow you social media accounts any anything like that feel free it's it's your it's your time all right no problem. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. That's where I do most of my social media stuff. It's amazingly at Sean Merwin, S-H-A-W-N-M-E-R-W-I-N. Uh, and I do a podcast once a week with Teo Sabadia where we do kind of like what we just did. Yeah, we just talk about news and game design stuff uh, that's called Mastering Dungeons and it's on the Misdirected Mark network. So you can go to misdirectedmark.com and see our podcast as well as a few others there. That's and you can follow. Well, that's well, we'll see what Teos has to say about that, but, uh, and you can follow the podcast Twitter. It's at mastering D N D. Mastering D N D. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, and thank, thank you, you so for having much, me. Sean. Oh, it was Absolutely. my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. It was great having you. And, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine what it's like to do the job that you do. So the, the fact that you were so kind to come and share that with us and, and especially our Patreon audience, um, I, I can, I can confidently say, uh, they are going to be very pleased and excited about this particular, uh, interview. So thank you again for yeah. joining us. No yeah. problem. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, this has been a great first episode. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am. Thank you so much, Sean Merwin, for being our first guest. 
Thank uh, you, Jared, for bringing Sean. That was like, <laughs> I cannot tell you how awesome that was. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I could have easily talked to him for two hours. Yeah. We could have easily <laughs> done in a whole, a whole series of these with just Sean. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to have to have him back on the show that's at right. some point. That's, that's, yeah. uh, that's what that means. Yeah. And speaking of this show would not be possible if it wasn't for our Patreons making it possible. And you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the dungeon run, where even at the lowest tier, you will have access to this show and a lot of our other uh, TDR, the dungeon run content. Right. This has been arcane artistry where we bring the artists and they bring the magic. Bye, See you next time.